Okay. Well, as usual, you can find uh, the handout on the website. Uh, <clears throat> I want to start off with uh, mentioning uh, my excuse for putting these extremely rough uh, lecture notes on the website. Uh, I do that just because I hope they might be useful to you. There's sometimes material in them that I don't manage to get uh, said. Uh, and my hope that that might sometimes be useful to you outweighs my embarrassment at uh, them being incomplete and chaotic. Uh, I appreciate that this is challenging material that, and what's perhaps most valuable about it, the connections between large, potentially important philosophical ideas and detailed proposals for implementation of them uh, well, it's complicated, it's intricate uh, stuff, and the details are also fluid and evolving. It's not that I pretend to see my way all the way to the bottom of this. So I just want to offer you all the help that I can uh, in uh, understanding it. So having the handout to look at during the uh, class and having the notes to go back over uh, I, I hope that's helpful in spite of the uh, incompleteness and flaws, particularly in the notes. If you do find yourself looking at those uh, notes, you might think of them the way I do as uh, uh, reflecting the wisdom of the advice that uh, I think originated with Leonard Bernstein, that to accomplish anything uh, of real importance, requires three things, uh, an idea, a plan for working it out, and not quite enough time. Uh, that, that last element is required to really pull it, uh, pull it together. So this week, we're uh, at an inflection point in uh, the trajectory of the course. We're making the transition between the two halves of the book manuscript uh, that's the source of the material I'm presenting in the seminar. Remember, the book is called uh, Reasons for Logic, Logic for Reasons. The reasons for logic is sort of motivating uh, the project, putting a, a set of criteria of adequacy, uh, saying what we would like the logic to do for us. Uh, and then logic for reasons is saying how it actually works. What, uh, uh, what sort of logic can uh, do this. Uh, and this is also a transition for me because uh, I feel I have a good grip on the first part of it. Uh, I know what I want a logic to do and why I want to do it, uh, why I want a logic to do that. Uh, as I mentioned before, I was not capable of coming up with a logic that could do this uh, or the semantics that goes with it. That's what Ulf uh, and Dan did. So uh, today we'll make the transition and begin to get into the um, uh, portion uh, where we're discussing uh, those results of Ulf and Dan's, where they move beyond what I was capable of doing uh, into territory where I'm mostly an admiring spectator and hoping to give you the tools to uh, appreciate what they've done uh, as I do. And because my grip is shakier, uh, you know, it's not work I did, it's only work uh, I appreciate, uh, they're going to be making guest appearances. Dan will join us next week to talk about uh, one of the exciting uh, consequences of his logic. Uh, the next week, Ulf will join us to present uh, his insights into the semantics in particular, the relation to Kit Fine's truthmaker semantics. And then the following week, Dan will come back uh, to talk about his implication space semantics, uh, which is the semantics inferentialists like me have been dreaming about for decades. Anyway, they will, they will be here to present some of that material. Uh, I'll be giving context for it. And most important, they'll be available for questions uh, about this more technical material where they're just on much solider ground uh, than I am. 
Uh, and you know, I'm going to try and be forthright about uh, where my understanding of the material ends and not pretend to uh, know things about it that I don't. Uh, but uh, the fact that uh, I have a, a, a relatively rudimentary understanding of some of this, I think can actually help me convey at least that rudimentary understanding that I have in a way that uh, Ulf and Dan, who are more uh, on top of all of the details, um, uh, may not be as able to. So let me start with a recap from last week. Last time we looked at two kinds of global structural principles that logicians have thought of as governing what I call reason relations, paradigmatically consequence relations or implications. These are monotonicity principles and transitivity principles, which together codify the relation of rational consequence Tarski goes back and forth in his classic essay between calling it uh, logical consequence uh, and just calling it consequence. And I've suggested that's an important distinction we should keep track of. Uh, these correspond to Tarski's closure conditions requiring consequence to be a topological closure uh, operator. And I've put uh, on the handout here, these first two lines, Monotonicity says that if you increase the uh, premise set from X to Y, you only increase the consequences. Uh, you don't lose any, you only get uh, more consequences. And transitivity says that uh, once you've extracted the consequences, if you take the consequences of those, uh, you don't get any more of them. That's the... Uh, Tarski version of these two uh, principles. Now, we saw last week that there are multiple grades of monotonicity and transitivity, stronger and weaker versions of them, and that they interact. Uh, in particular, uh, one of the more detailed arguments I gave is that stronger forms of transitivity can promote weaker forms of monotonicity up the uh, hierarchy until they have the same effect as stronger ones. Um, and so, so that for instance, um, uh, mixed cut uh, transitivity, mixed, uh, mixed context cut or transitivity uh, can make cautious monotonicity have the effect of full monotonicity. And although I didn't talk about this last week, the effects run in the other direction uh, as well. Um, let's stop this. Uh, in the context of the highest grade of monotonicity, uh, MO, the difference between mixed context cut and shared context cut, C2, that difference vanishes. Uh, the, the weaker form has the same effect as the stronger form. And even uh, what I called weak cumulative transitivity, uh, which requires not only shared context, but only lets you cut on persistent consequences. Uh, if you have the strongest form of monotonicity, that's equivalent to mixed context uh, cut. So picking strong monotonicity principles can promote uh, weaker forms of transitivity to have the same effect. Strong forms of transitivity can promote weak forms of monotonicity to have the same effect. This is all the fine structure of the interaction of these two fundamental kinds of structural principles. It's the fine structure of what I've called closure, closed structure. Um, you probably don't need to understand how all that works, uh, but I think it's useful to know that there is this uh, fine structure uh, to it. And I suggested that a particularly interesting and uh, illuminating lens through which to view closure structures is the operation I called rational explicitation, uh, which is defined uh, on sequence. Uh, maybe it's a good 
would look at this uh, again. Uh, the operative metaphor driving this idiom, this vocabulary, this way of talking or thinking is that the elements of the premise set are explicitly contained in it. They're members of a set, and so are its explicit content. And its consequences, what's implied by it, then count as its implicit content, implicit in the literal sense of implied by, uh, just as that etymology suggests. So explicitating a bit of content is moving it from the right side of the implication turnstile, the conclusion side, the implicit side, uh, to the left-hand side, the premise side, the explicit side of a sequent. That's what explicitly acknowledging some consequence of your uh, belief is, uh, making explicit what was implicit in the premise set. And I suggested that, uh, uh, a promising way of thinking about uh, the effect of these closure principles is to think about them in terms of uh, what they say about explicitation. And here, if we look at the cautious monotonicity and cumulative transitivity here in the display, uh, first of all, when they're written in this Genson uh, style, which says, you know, if you have the two sequence above the line, uh, then you always also have the sequence below the line. And we can see that mono cautious monotonicity and cumulative transitivity, CM and C2, the sort of middle versions in strength of these principles are duals uh, in that they just relate the same three sequence. Uh, we hold the uh, X implies A constant and swap the other two. Uh, and thought of that way, uh, the monotonicity principle says that explicitation never loses or subtracts any implicit content. And the transitivity principle says that explicitation never gains any implicit content. If something is a consequence when you've explicitated a consequence, it was already uh, a consequence. So together they say, you don't change the implicit content at all by expli explicating, making explicit some of it. Uh, in the slogan I suggested, explicitation is inconsequential. And I argued that uh, though that often might be true, uh, it isn't always true. Uh, and that there are important cases where explicitly acknowledging a consequence of commitments that you've explicitly acknowledged actually makes a difference. Uh, that's sort of a paradigmatic rational activity is realizing that what you're uh, explicitly committed to accept has consequences and acknowledging those consequences now explicitly. That's a paradigmatic rational activity. And we shouldn't build into our logic uh, the denial of that. Uh, the claim that doing that doesn't make any difference. Uh, so uh, we would like a logic that's able to talk about those uh, consequences, which means uh, not imposing uh, a priori uh, uh, to begin with uh, those closure structural principles on the reason relations uh, that we're talking about. Um, so, so that that. I think was the most important uh, uh, point from last time. But a point not to be overlooked is that uh, rational explicitation in this sense, uh, explicitation defined on uh, reason relations as they show up in sequence, corresponds to pragmatically explicit and implicit normative deontic statuses as they showed up in our pragmatic meta vocabulary, in our pragmatic uh, definitions of uh, uh, reason relations. Yeah, 
So uh, once again, to remind you, uh, this is the pragmatically explicit and implicit. Remember we said, if X implies A, X implies A, we said that reason relation holds, if and only if explicit commitment to accept all of X precludes entitlement to reject A. That's as it were the explicit content of the reason relation put in normative pragmatic terms. But I said, think about it. Uh, you know, here's a useful way to think about it. If you're explicitly precluded from entitlement to, to reject A, then you count as implicitly committed to accept it. That's the only position left for you to adopt. Um, so that was a notion of a pragmatically implicit commitment. But you see that a consequence that is implied by a premise set and so is implicit in it in the rational explicitation sense just is what you're implicitly committed to committed to accept by being explicitly committed to accept the premise set. So the notion of pragmatically implicit commitments to accept and rationally implicit uh, content, those are two sides of one coin. Uh, that's the same phenomenon, uh, the same reason relation thought of on the one hand pragmatically in terms of um, uh, what you're committed to uh, and thought of on the other hand uh, in terms of the implicit content of uh, your explicit uh, premises that is what you're explicitly uh, committed to. What we're gonna look at today is a third sense of the implicit explicit um, uh, relation, the sense in which the job of specifically logical locutions, according to logical expressivists, is to make explicit reason relations of implication and incompatibility. Uh, but now, before I move on to that, uh, that's the end of the recap. Uh, looking back, uh, any questions or comments about uh, those thoughts? Yeah, Hassan. Yeah, so I, I have a question. Can you hear me? I, I know I'm masked. I can. Uh, um, I have a question about the, the snake turnstile in, in the rational uh, sense of explicitation or explicit, implicit in the pragmatic sense. So it, it seems to me that, you know, right at, for the pragmatic case, when you're writing that it's a, it's a relationship between acts, right? Uh, and then in the rational case, uh, the point we're making is that, um, you know, uh, moving something from the right-hand side to the left-hand side can make a difference. So I guess my, my question is, you know, if, if it's just a, a relationship between acts, like sort of that, that's like has to do with the acts and obtains anyway should we should we understand it in the rational case as like you know coming to become uh coming to awareness uh, of uh of that relationship is what has the consequence not just the two different uh yeah statements. I, I mean i oh uh, i want to think of these as two as two sides of one coin so pragmatically, we understand what we mean by writing that snake turnstile. It's the snake, by the way, because it's not a closure operation. Um, uh, we understand what we mean by that uh, in terms of practical attitudes of acceptance and rejection, in terms of normative statuses of commitment and entitlement, Remember the two, two uh, dimensional normative uh, deontic structure. Uh, so uh, thought of that way, we're saying, well, what's the consequence of uh, explicitly acknowledging commitment to accept these premises? 
And we say, well, that implicitly commits you to uh, accept the conclusion. Uh, explicitly, what it does is preclude you to be in, entitled to reject it. But that's implicitly, uh, we said, committing you to accept it. Uh, that's how we understand the relation between the reason relation of implication and discursive practices uh, of uh, defending a claim by giving reasons for it, uh, for instance. Um, but we can see a reflection of that feature of um, discursive practices uh, in the contents. That induces uh, a notion of implicit content uh, that's already in the claimables that you uh, explicitly acknowledged commitment to accept. We can say, well, this means that besides the explicit content uh, of those commitments, we can talk about an implicit uh, commitment too. And, and that means that when we look at this purely formal process of uh, moving a conclusion from the right side of the turnstile, the conclusion side to the premise side, we can think of that as the formal representation of uh, the practical attitude of explicitly acknowledging uh, something that you were implicitly committed to because it followed from uh, what you had before. Uh, so uh, the the pragmatics and the ration, uh, and the reason relations notions of explicit and implicit go hand in hand here. Yeah, Thomas. I think you're still muted. This is just a minor question, but um, in again in the pragmatic uh, explicit and implicit section on the first page, um, why is it that if you're explicitly precluded from entitlement to reject A, that you're implicitly committed to accept A instead of implicitly committed to either accept A or suspend judgment on, on A? Is this just a base case where? If uh, it, it, it's that uh, option of uh, not taking any stance on it that makes it a merely implicit commitment on your part. I see. Okay. Uh, uh, if you didn't have that option, it would just be uh, that commitment to these things commits you to these other things. Explicitly. Uh, explicitly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we're by by doing this bilaterally by, mm -hmm. by having connections in the picture as well. One of the things we get is the space for a pragmatic distinction between your explicit commitments to accept, mm -hmm. which are your premises, and in this sense the implicit. Uh, one, the, the space is exactly uh, the space you're pointing to by that option of not uh, taking a stand. Okay. And we'll see, uh, I mean, it's not clear how much we're going to go into this, but uh, there's a deep relation between uh, the two sides of the turnstile here uh, and uh, paracomplete logics, which are ones that leave you the option of not taking uh, a stand pragmatically, mm -hmm. normally thought of in terms of truth value gaps. Okay. Uh, and on the other uh, and on the other hand, paraconsistent uh, logics. Uh, a, a paracomplete logic is like strong cleaning K three. Uh, a logic of, in the usual semantics, truth gaps, uh, a paraconsistent logic like Graham Priest's uh, LP, uh, another three-valued uh, logic uh, is, in its normal semantics, is a, uh, a logic that allows truth value blots where something can be both true and false. Uh, so yeah, this, this is a paracompleteness phenomenon. Okay. Uh, but doing it in pragmatics, I don't need to talk about truth to uh, make mm -hmm. sense. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Okay, good. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so uh, the first uh, substantive new thing uh, I want to say, uh, still on the reasons for logic uh, side, is to ask the very general question, what is logic? And uh, sort of downstream from that a little bit, why should philosophers care uh, about it? Uh, it's this mathematical discipline. Uh, sure, philosophers might gain insight from studying sort of any particular discipline, but what is it about this corner of mathematics that would make it of any interest uh, to philosophers? Um, now, you know, if we ask what is logic, nearly every philosopher of logic is going to have their own answer to that question. I mean, there's some broad schools, but uh, the details matter. Uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of the popular uh, strands of thought here, contrasting it with uh, the newfangled and still pretty idiosyncratic uh, answer that is the one I'll be pursuing. Um, I think the two most important sub-questions uh, to the what is logic question is, first of all, the reason, what I call the reasons question. What is the relation between logic and reasons? Uh, that is between consequence or implication on the one hand and incompatibility. We divided the reason relations into these uh, two parts. And the second one is uh, what's traditionally called the demarcation question. What is the distinctive role characteristic of specifically logical vocabulary and the concepts that that logical vocabulary expresses? It's the answer to that demarcation question that's going to guide us in deciding whether various candidate bits of, of logical vocabulary uh, deserve to count as genuinely logical. So the sorts of things people have fought over, well, what about the set theoretic epsilon that expresses set membership? Is that a logical mo notion? If it is, then set theory is a, is a branch of logic and anything we can do in set theory, we're really doing in logic. Uh, that's uh, a pretty easy way to be a logicist about mathematics if uh, you get the set theoretic epsilon uh, into logic. But how are we supposed to decide that? Uh, Quine argued that uh, alethic modal operators were not part uh, of logic. Uh, you know, Ruth Marcus and Saul Kripke strenuously disagreed. Uh, uh, how is that to be decided? Well, that's uh, the demarcation question. What about higher order quantifiers that let us do all kinds of uh, all kinds of things? Um, uh, are, are those properly part uh, of logic? That's the demarcation uh, question. And uh, in the sixties and seventies, uh, the question that philosophers of logic popularly associated with the demarcation question was not the reasons question, but the correctness question. So uh, within two years of each other, uh, Hilary Putnam and Quine uh, published article, uh, published books called uh, The Philosophy of Logic. And each of them took the two biggest problems in the philosophy of logic to be the demarcation question and the correctness question. Correctness question is, what's the right logic? Uh, they were looking historically at the dispute in the 20th century between fans of classical logic and fans of intuitionist logic. Uh, they thought of a philosophy of logic should tell you which of those is the correct logic. Um, in uh, the subsequent 20 years, uh, Dummett made a very powerful case for intuitionism being the right uh, logic, basically on uh, semantic grounds. Uh, I want to argue that the uh, reasons question is really more 
important. We should start with that uh, question. Um, and I'll say something about how I think the correctness question arises uh, then. Um, but uh, I think the uh, answer to the reasons question is going to give us the raw materials to address the demarcation question. And so it's the one I recommend focusing on uh, when we think about what logic is uh, and uh, why philosophers should uh, care about it. The traditional answer to the question, to the reason question, what's the relation between logic and reasons, is what I call logicism about reasons. It says uh, that logic is a theory of reasons, is the theory of reasons. Uh, it says good reasons are always logically good reasons. Logic is what determines what good reasons are. Uh, on this view, suppose I claim uh, the streets are gonna be wet at the end of the seminar and you challenge that claim and I defend it by offering a reason. I say, well, it's raining. Uh, this is all counterfactual where I am and I assume it is where you are, but uh, that, that's my answer, it's raining. That's why, uh, that's my reason for claiming that the streets will be wet at the end of the seminar. The logicist about good reasons thinks that my argument is incomplete, that the reason that I haven't really given a complete reason for concluding that uh, the streets will be wet by citing the claim that it's raining. Uh, he thinks that what I've offered is what old timey logicians called an enthymeme, an argument with a missing or a suppressed premise. Uh, their notion of an implicit premise, what you need to add to what I said in order to give a genuinely good reason. And what they think you need to add is a conditional. They think the real argument goes, assertion of a conditional. If it's raining, then the streets will be wet. Then what I actually said, it's raining. So the streets will be wet. The missing premise is a conditional, which they think of as a substantive non-logical premise, but it's essentially expressed using logical vocabulary. And there always must be something like that, they think. But if you think of the good reason as really having two premises, first the conditional, if it's raining, then the streets will be wet. And then uh, what I said, affirming the antecedent of it, the, it's raining, concluding, so the streets will be wet, is an instance of modus ponens, of a logically valid uh, form of uh, good reasoning, detaching from a conditional uh, when you can join it with the antecedent. And they say, insofar as what I said, it's raining, so it'll be wet, so, so the streets will be wet. Insofar as that was a reason, it was because it was part of this logically good reason. Uh, and on this view, the capacity to reason is always an implicitly logical capacity. Uh, as Dan Dennett, uh, who endorsed uh, this view, uh, put it, uh, it's an implicitly logical capacity because it need not be manifested in the ability, for instance, to sort sentences into which are the logical tautologies and which are not. Uh, that, that we might teach students to do in a logic class, that would be an explicitly logical capacity. But the, but the capacity to tell good reasons from bad reasons is implicitly uh, a logical capacity because I'm implicitly detaching from a conditional here, even if that's not uh, what I know uh, I'm doing. Uh, this. Oh, uh, oh, uh, this view is not uh, some recent uh, product of 
the revolution in mathematical logic that starts uh, with Frege, it actually is the dominant view in early modern philosophy. Uh, we find it already in Montaigne, uh, who says that animals implicitly appreciate disjunctive syllogism. And he describes a dog on the hunt who's chasing a rabbit and the path forks, he can't see which way the rabbit went, and the dog runs down one of the paths and sniffs the ground. And if he doesn't smell the rabbit there, he immediately runs on the other path without stopping to sniff, to sniff there. And Montaigne says, uh, obviously what he's doing is manifesting implicit grasp of the disjunctive syllogism. Well, it's, it's A or B, it's not A, so it must be B. That's what he's doing when he doesn't stop to sniff. On the second one, he implicitly grasps this disjunctive syllogism in the sense that the intelligence he's showing, the, the grasp of a reason here that uh, the rabbit didn't go down the one path is a reason for thinking it went down the other path. He's saying that's implicitly showing his grasp of this uh, logical principle his reasoning really is, uh, uh, has as a premise of this disjunctive syllogism that uh, if you have A or B and not A, that B uh, follows from it. So uh, this uh, logicism about reasons that looks to understand good reasons in terms of logically good reasons, uh, it's something like the traditional, uh, the traditional answer to the reasons uh, question. Now we'll see there's other uh, uh, alternatives to it, but it, it is the, the traditional uh, uh, answer. Uh, the alternative I want us to think about, uh, oh, and, uh, Logicism about reasons uh, gives a good reason, a meta reason, for philosophers to care about logic. Philosophers care about reasons, and logic is the theory of good reasons. It's what uh, distinguishes good from bad reasons and explains why good reasons are good reasons. So if as a philosopher you care about reasons, uh, you need to do logic. That, that's at the core of philosophy. Uh, something like that was the implicit reasoning motivating analytic philosophy, the analytic project. Why was logic so important? It's because it was a theory of reasons. Uh, an alternative answer uh, is what I call logical expressivism. Uh, rational logical expressivism. It says, uh, What's distinctive about logic, the distinctive job about logic uh, is not to determine what's a good reason or a bad reason, but to let us talk about reasons, to let us make explicit reason relations, uh, make explicit uh, implication relations by using the conditional, uh, make explicit incompatibility relations, by using negation, uh, those are the paradigmatic uh, sentential logical uh, uh, bits of vocabulary. Parenthetically, we're not gonna talk about anything but sentential logic. Uh, it's complicated enough. <laughs> we're not gonna look at uh, quantificational uh, logic. But logical expressivism says, uh, that logic expresses reason relations. It's a tool for talking about them. And the relation between uh, the argument that, that in the little story I told, uh, the streets will be wet. Why? My reason is uh, it's raining. Uh, and the conditional, if it's raining, then the streets will be wet, is not that that conditional is an additional premise that you need to add to what I said to get a good argument. No, my argument was good already. 
not in virtue of logic, but in virtue of what rain means and wet means. Part of what that means is that rain makes stuff wet. Uh, if you understand what rain is and what wet is, that's the kind of thing that your understanding consists in, is grasping the goodness of that inference. Uh, that doesn't have anything to do with logic. The conditional now comes in and lets us say that that's a good implication. That the implication from uh, it's raining to the streets will be wet is a good one. We can put that in a sentence using the logical vocabulary of if then. Logic isn't telling us what follows from what in the sense of explaining it or determining it. It's letting us talk about what follows from what. Uh, it's letting us make explicit in the form of a sentence something that is explicit in the sense, a, a sentence now is something that's explicit in the sense that uh, it can, it's a claimable, it expresses a claimable, something you can accept or reject, something that we can demand reasons for or offer reasons against, uh, something that can, can serve as a reason for and against. Uh, the distinctive expressive job characteristic of logic is to make those reason relations, which are implicit in our discursive practices of giving and asking for reasons, uh, in the sense uh, in which we've seen, to make those implicit reason relations that govern the giving and asking for reasons that's an essential part of making claims, the defending and challenging of them is uh, an essential part of that, to make it explicit uh, by putting it in sentential form, in the form now of something that uh, we can demand reasons for, if uh, and, and so talk about, uh, can challenge uh, this implication. So what can be put in a sentence is explicit in a distinctive sense of being a claimable that may need to be rationally defended uh, and can be rationally challenged. Logic on the expressivist view is the tool we use to make reason relations explicit. Yeah, Tomas. So one thing to me that um, I've been struggling to, to, to understand from the, since the beginning of the course is, and maybe it's helpful now that uh, you put this contrast up between the two ways of thinking about the relation between logic and reason, is if you think that you know, using logic gives you the reasons, oh, gives you what, tells you what the good reason relations are, or maybe let's start, start uh, back a little bit. The issue is how do you adjudicate, what are the criteria for good reasons? And, and uh, the, the logic thing is helpful because if, if everyone agrees what logic is, you know, supposing they do, suppose everyone say, hey, classical logic, there is a correct logic, classical logic is the one, is the correct one. Now we know what the reason relations are. Um, but it, but if it goes in the other way, uh, how how do we adjudicate what what are the good reasons? So you know the example Tweety is a bird, so Tweety can fly. You know the, the example that you're doing, and uh, but then you add Tweety as a penguin. You know, only if that's explicit as part of the the the, the original premise set are you are you uh, not committed, not entitled to to um, to infer. You know. Tweety can fly. But in the first case, I just want to say, well, no, you, you Tweety is a bird, therefore Tweety can fly. No, you, you, you don't. That's not a, that's not a good reason. Um, because there are, there are not just a single bird that can't fly. And maybe you think you shouldn't call that a bird, but there are lots of birds that can't fly. Penguins can't fly. Dodos can't fly. Emus can't fly. Uh, you know, all, all the well, injured birds can't anymore. fly. Yeah. Yeah. Injured. Well, well, yeah, but that's, uh, maybe if you think that there are some, uh, yeah, so, so I, I, this is just bringing to light to me that, like, how do we adjudicate what are the good reasons, what count as good reasons in the first place, so that we can uh, figure out what the right logic is for expressing the, the good reasons or, or the relations between reasons and reasoning. Um, that's just something that I've been struggling to think about since uh, the okay, beginning. Okay, good. Uh... I mean, I want to say 
good reason is said in many ways. Uh, there, there are many things to mean by good reason. And uh, Tweety's a bird is not a dispositively good reason for concluding Tweety can fly. Uh, it's a probatively good uh, reason using this jurisprudential distinction. It's a pro tanto uh, reason. And uh, the claim I want to make as an expressivist is our logic should be expressively powerful enough to talk about all the senses of uh, good reason. Uh, that, that's the criterion of adequacy that expressivism gives to uh, logic. So logic should not build in uh, monotonicity, for instance, because that won't help with this merely probative. Uh, it, it won't let us you know, argue whether even in the probative sense, that's a, a, a good uh, reason. So one certainly could uh, pick out a sense of good reason uh, that is the one codified by classical logic, say. Uh, and it's going to be structurally closed and so monotonic and so on. Uh, and this is absolutely relevant to uh, the correctness question that, that I mentioned. Uh, if uh, you answer the reason question uh, the way I've suggested, I've just sort of put on the table the expressivism, that gives you an answer to the demarcation question. It says, uh, to be a bit of logical vocabulary is to add the expressive power to make reason relations explicit. So uh, the paradigm of logical vocabulary is the conditional that lets you say that this conclusion follows from these premises, put it in a sentence, and negation that lets you say that um, red and green are incompatible by saying uh, red implies not green. Uh, so, so that we can make that uh, explicit and now uh, argue about it. That's the criterion of demarcation is playing this expressive role. As I say, the paradigms are the conditional and negation. Uh, what about conjunction and disjunction? Well, they don't play the same central uh, reason mm -hmm. relation explicitating role that the conditional negation do. Uh, they're aggregative devices. Roughly the conjunction is making explicit what the comma does on the left of the turnstile and the, the disjunction is making explicit what the comma does on the right side of the turnstile. They're important auxiliaries. Uh, sometimes I derisively refer to conjunction and disjunction as Boolean helper monkeys uh, to distinguish them from the sort of first class logical vocabulary of uh, conditionals and negation. But if you have that, uh, if you have an expressivist answer to the reasons question, then that gives you an answer to the demarcation uh, question. Now, exactly how's that going to apply to you know, these problematic cases? The, uh, set theoretic epsilon and so on. Well, that, that's all downstream. I don't want to talk about that uh, yet. But what does it say about uh, the correctness question? Well, it enforces a pluralist dismissal of that question. It says there is no such thing as the, the correct logic. The right question to ask about basically the conditional and the negation of some logic which parenthetically is where there's a difference between classical logic and intuitionist logic. It comes out mostly in the conditional and in uh, negation. Uh, the right question is not which of the conditionals is the right one, which of the negations is the right one. And so which logic is correct. The right question to ask about a logic is not whether it's correct or not, but what sense of good reason does it codify? So for instance, uh, the much maligned horseshoe of classical logic. Uh, I say it's much maligned because uh, 
of all the ways in which it's clear that it's not the if then of English that it's uh, expressing, not we wouldn't assert all the conditionals that have false antecedents, for instance. Uh, but there is a sense of good implication that it codifies. The sense in which it's a good thing if an implication doesn't have premises that are true and a conclusion that's not true. Uh, at least it would be a bad thing about an implication, a candidate implication, if it had premises that were true and a conclusion uh, that was not true. Uh, so it's a minimal kind of goodness of implication that you're codifying using that. Uh, is that the right conditional? Well, the intuitionist conditional codifies a sense of good implication, it says the implication from A to B is a good one. If there's a systematic way of turning an argument for A into an argument for B, originally it was a systematic recipe for turning a proof of A into a proof mm -hmm. of B, but we can generalize that uh, a little bit and say, oh, well, that actually is a good, uh, uh, an interest, potentially interesting sense of uh, good uh, implication. Why do you say it's a good implication? Because I can give you a recipe that will turn reasons for the antecedent into reasons for the conclusion. That's what I mean by good implication in the sense in which the intuitionist uh, conditional makes it explicit. What about C.I. Lewis's hook of uh, strict implication? The sense of good implication that it makes explicit is the sense in which it's a good feature of an implication if uh, it's a necessary if it's necessary that if the uh, premises are true then the conclusion is true. Well, yes, that's a, an intelligible uh, sense of good implication. Uh, for the expressivist, uh, the uh, counsel of wisdom is let a hundred flowers blossom. Uh, there are as many senses of good implication as there are reasons to give and ask for reasons and contexts for it. One sense of good reason is, uh, well, there's a good argument from the sacred book that will take you from the premises to the conclusion. Well, then, there's a point to codifying a conditional uh, that would make that uh, explicit. Uh, when you put forward a logic, that's the question to ask. What sense of good reason for, of implication, and of incompatibility? I mean, there are different senses of uh, incompatible uh, as well. Um, what sense is it that it codifies? That's the question to ask. So the correctness question goes away. We're pluralists, uh, but we do have a way of, you know, we have a question to ask the logic. To understand the logic, let's see what sense of good reason does it make explicit. But what you would really like is uh, a conditional negation that could make any sense of uh, implication and negation explicit. Uh, at any rate, any of the many different sorts of structures, so monotonic, non-monotonic, transitive, mm -hmm. transitive uh, and so on. Is that helpful? Yeah, no, it, it is. Um, uh, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I, I need to think about it a bit more or think about what the different ways of thinking about it are. But as far as I understand it, um, you get these different lot. Assume you're a pluralist. That doesn't mean that you're uh, uh, you have tolerance for any uh, logic. You know, you might think, well, here's a logic for uh, you know expressing the reason relations in this kind of reasoning. Suppose someone doesn't think that um, you know you have the holy book, right? The sacred book. You 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 codify a, a sense of implication for that. Well, someone might say, well, that's, those aren't good reasons. That's not a good reason. So I'm not allowing this logic. And so you, you're, you can be a pluralist without uh, being completely tolerant of any sort of 
whatever right. fangled. Um, I mean, if stuff. if what it's making explicit is nonsense, then I don't care about yeah. it. Uh, well, but is there another way of saying it? There's no correct logic, but there are correct logics in, in the sense that like you think there are there there are good some forms of good reasoning. There are logics for those reasonings. Those are the correct logics, so to speak. Um, does would that be more amenable to? Yeah, uh, I mean, to say this this view is going to translate your independent assessment of what senses of good reason are really good reasons right right yeah uh, into uh, a way of cutting down the candidate logics okay yeah um, so so then the question is you know do people at what well what what are these good reasons what are the good reason relations yeah. do people people so, are yeah so uh i mean we're restricting ourselves here to um theoretical reasoning uh and it's not that what we're saying is irrelevant to practical reasoning but <laughs> things are complicated enough yeah but uh, you know utilitarians have a sense of what a good reason is uh, uh in practical philosophy now we can ask well what would the utilitarian conditional look like the one that codified being a util a good reason in the utilitarian sense for uh, doing something. Uh, this is how you ought to think about uh, quantum logics, uh, where uh, one of the most powerful, I think, observations uh, about quantum logics that um, allowed disjunctions to be true without either disjunct. Uh, being true to slit uh, experiment uh, is that uh, classical logic is what you get if you represent the content of a proposition in physics by the region of phase space in that which extent, it, yeah. right so so a proposition is a subspace and in classical mechanics the spaces are Euclidean, and you get a Boolean logic of inclusion uh, and intersection and union of those subspaces. So classical logic is the right logic for classical mechanics. But in quantum mechanics, we're doing it all with Hilbert spaces. And the algebra of Hilbert spaces is different. It's precisely, it doesn't give us a Boolean algebra. It gives us a quantum logical algebra. Uh, and so there's a reason to, you know, use the, the quantum logic uh, in it. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is this has been helpful. Thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, here's a recipe for a philosophical project. It says, so suppose you understand uh, the relation between logic and reasons in this expressive way, so that you think. Uh, the important thing that uh, about Frege's logic in the Begriff Schrift is not what he proved, the logically true propositions, which for an expressivist just codify the content of the logical concepts. It wasn't what logic let us prove, it was what it let us say that we could use uh, the uh, vocabulary and the concepts that vocabulary expresses that he gave us to make non-logical claims, uh, conditionals that are not logically true, to say things like, if it's raining, then the streets will be wet. And you can argue, you say, well, not if the temperature is high enough. Uh, have you ever been in a place where it was so hot that uh, the rain evaporated before it hit the ground? Well, now we can argue about whether that implication is a good one because it's a claim that you can explicitly commit yourself to. And so someone can challenge it. Someone can uh, respond uh, to it. Uh, so it brings it into the game of giving and asking for reasons as something that can be given as a reason and for which reasons can be asked. That's a notion of explicit and uh, 
the function of logical vocabulary on this expressivist line is to make reason relations explicit. Yeah, Brenda. Hi, thank you. Um, can you can you be a logical expressivist but still think that reason relations are transcendental and not take the pragmatist view of reason relations? I mean, I'm not sure what you mean by transcendental, but objective that sort of they're determined by how things are. Sure, um, uh, that's going to make you not so interested in some senses of follows from. Uh, if the reasons you care about are to be read off the way the world uh, is, well, uh, we don't have to wave our hands about this. Uh, uh, Kid Fine's truthmaker semantics is uh, a way of metaphysically grounding uh, reason relations, consequence relations, and incompatibility relations. It's his semantics means to tell us uh, what it is for states of the world to be truth makers and false makers for claims uh, in such a way that we can derive reason relations uh, from them. And we'll see this uh, astonishing uh, semantic result of uh, Ulf Lobel that he'll talk about in two weeks uh, is showing us what the connection is between that and uh, expressivism in, uh, in logic. So let me just issue a promissory note uh, for that. But yes, uh, expressivism doesn't uh, involve a commitment to what makes good reasons good reasons other than it isn't logic, except for, uh, uh, I mean, there, there are claims, there are reason relations that hold simply in virtue of logic, that's the logical consequence relations. Any logic is going to have some of those. Uh, but uh, the expressivist claim is that's a special set. It's not sort of all of them. That's okay. helpful. Thank you. Oh, good. Let me mention before I move on to the next point, just some other bits of philosophy of logic space here. Uh, there are people, uh, Neil Tennant is one, uh, who says it's not all reasons that logic aims to explain. Uh, he sees logic as uh, having this the very specific domain specific task of systematizing the notions of implication and incompatibility in play in mathematical reasoning. Uh, and if that's what you want to do, uh, it's clear you want a closed structural uh, set of reason relations. Um, that's the way it is in mathematics. Um, it's not so clear why philosophers in general should care about that project of codifying uh, the reasoning in logic. Uh, although philosophy as we know it pretty much began with Plato being so impressed with Euclid's argumentation in the elements that he said, maybe that's the key to reasons in general. Uh, but uh, that's the origin of the logicist uh, uh, program. And I think you know, that was a good idea, Plato, but it wasn't right. No, you will not understand reasoning in general by understanding Euclidean uh, argumentation. Uh, I think, that, anyway, that, that's uh, a commitment we have. A second um, oh, region of contemporary philosophy of logic space that I should mention uh, it, as an answer to the what is logic um, claim is that there is this tradition uh, that Tarski started. So one of the greats, uh, uh, partly thinking about Frege, but mostly thinking about the Erlangen program uh, in uh, Felix Klein's Erlangen program in geometry in the 19th century, uh, which was 
ranking different geometries by their generality according to uh, what symmetries they exhibited. Uh, so projective geometry was more uh, general than affine geometry, and that was more general than Euclidean geometry because it was invariant under more transformations. Uh, and Tarski suggested uh, a permutation uh, criterion for logical uh, argumentation that says, well, that in its current incarnation, Gila Scher is maybe the uh, one who has worked this out best, but it's recently been endorsed by Tim Williamson, that thinks of logic not as the theory of all reason relations, but as the theory of all maximally topic neutral uh, reason relations. All the implications and incompatibilities that hold no matter what you're talking about, no matter what domain uh, you're talking about. And they can admit, oh, well, in physics, there may be special reason relations. Uh, in courts of law, there may be special reason relations. Those aren't the ones that logic explains the goodness of. It only explains the goodness of um, reasons that hold in every domain. Now, this is something we'll come, come back to, I think, uh, in connection with the, with the semantics. But that's uh, a restricted version of uh, the logicism. If you're interested in pursuing uh, that notion, uh, John McFarlane's uh, unpublished but widely available dissertation on uh, the notion of for, the notion, the idea that logic is formal discusses this as the topic neutrality notion of formality and has the most insightful and sophisticated criticism uh, of it. But I just mentioned that's uh, uh, domain restricted, not as domain restricted as the tenant, oh, it's just about mathematical reasoning view, uh, but it's not the full-blown traditional uh, logicism about reasons view either. Uh, so uh, logicism about reasons and uh, rational expressivism about logic are uh, mutually exclusive answers to the reason uh, to the reason question of how logic relates uh, to reasons, uh, but they're not exhaustive. Uh, you don't have to go uh, with either uh, of those. Okay, well then let me say something beginning to fill in the notion of um, rational logical expressivism. The, the um, prefix rational uh, is to mark explicitly that what logic expresses is reason relations. Uh, it's not just anything uh, that it does. And starting in uh, my John Locke lectures, published as Between Saying and Doing, uh, I divided the labor uh, of logical vocabulary uh, into two parts. Uh, there's two things that have to be true of logical vocabulary uh, in order for it to uh, perform the expressive function that logical expressivism is trying to characterize. Uh, this starts with a distinction between a base vocabulary, uh, the one whose reason relations you're going to make explicit, and the logically extended vocabulary uh, within which you're going to make explicit uh, the reason relations of the base vocabulary uh, by adding uh, logical vocabulary to it. So the thought is the base vocabulary already has uh, material reason relations. That's Seller's term for it. It just means non-logical or pre-logical relations of implication and incompatibility. Um, how should the logically extended vocabulary relate to uh, that vocabulary. Um, here's a good place uh, for me to say, uh, 
more clearly than I have before what I mean by vocabulary. Um, remember, I introduced the idiom. Uh, I used the term picking up from Rorty uh, and suggested that Rorty's use of it is self-consciously downstream from Quine's Two Dogmas of Empiricism, where Quine uh, gave us good reasons to be suspicious for natural languages about the language theory distinction, uh, at least in the sense of uh, distinguishing uh, inferences that are good because of what we mean by our words. And, and so as a matter of what language we're speaking from inferences that are good, implications that hold in virtue of contingent facts and ways the world is. Uh, Klein uh, is making a point we can recognize as a Wittgensteinian point uh, and saying, uh, you know, when you see the interconnectedness of um, uh, our discursive practices, the idea that you could factor um, the goodness of implications and attribute them exclusively to the one or to the other or to some mixture, uh, that's a, a theoretical fantasy. Well, if we're not going to distinguish languages and theories, meanings and uh, beliefs as sources of the goodness of reason uh, relations. Let's talk about vocabularies uh, that uh, are sort of ways of talking that include commitments both about what implications are good uh, and commitments to how things are, to, to what claims one should make. But I've used, uh, and I've said about uh, the term vocabulary that I would use it in a capacious and elastic way uh, to include things like nautical or culinary vocabulary, uh, logical vocabulary, the vocabulary of physics, uh, but also uh, autonomous vocabularies, autonomous discursive practices, that is language games you could play though you played no other, uh, that's a special kind of vocabulary. Um, okay, but, but now we're actually in a position to say more, to give a, a more specific technical use of the notion of vocabulary. So henceforth by vocabulary, I shall mean the pair of what I'll call a lexicon and a set of reason relations. The lexicon is just the set of all the sentences, um, which in a base vocabulary is gonna be things like, uh, the sign is red. Uh, in ordinary empirical descriptive vocabulary, uh, the lexicon is uh, some set of sentences you can use to say how things are. Um, and uh, when I talk about ordinary empirical descriptive vocabulary, I mean, it's not just that set of sentences, but it's also the reason relations they stand in. What are the good implication relations? What are the incompatibilities uh, that they stand in? And there's various ways of representing that, which will be ways of specifying the reason relations of a vocabulary. Uh, so uh, understanding logic is going to be understanding the relation between a base vocabulary, a set of sentences, a lexicon, that is logically atomic sentences. You can think of them as just sentence letters, uh, if you like, uh, together with reason relations on them, uh, a set of good implications, a set of good uh, incompatibilities of incompatibilities that hold uh, of them. And we've told a story about how that's related to the use of uh, items of the lexicon, which will express claimables in virtue of being used according to the norms uh, uh, codified in the reason relations. So, uh, in my informal use of vocabulary, I said, uh, look, this is not just an uninterpreted calculus or a set of 
symbols, uh, uh, by vocabulary, I'm gonna mean those symbols in use as they're used. Uh, but I claim that the story I've told about the relation between reason relations among contents uh, and uh, practices of giving reasons for and against, uh, defending and challenging acceptances and rejections of uh, those claimables uh, lets us go from uh, a vocabulary in this technical sense of a lexicon and a set of reason relations to an account of uh, the proper use uh, of those expressions. Um, so understanding the expressive task of logic is going to be understanding the relation between a base vocabulary and a logically extended vocabulary uh, that includes, for instance, not just that's red and that's green, which are in the lexicon of the base vocabulary, the ordinary empirical descriptive vocabulary, but also claims like, uh, if it's red, then it's colored. That's a good uh, implication, which is a sentence put in a, in a, a form of a conditional in the logical vocabulary that extends that base vocabulary. And uh, one of the reason relations in the base vocabulary is that uh, saying the sign is green is incompatible with saying that it's red. Uh, well, we'll have a sentence in the uh, logically extended language. If it's red, then it's not green, conditional and negation, which says that. Um, so what I want to talk about is the relation between base vocabularies and logically extended vocabularies uh, on that base. And the fact that there is a base vocabulary, the one whose reason relations are explicitly expressed in the logical vocabulary, means that the logical vocabulary counts as a meta vocabulary in a sense in which ordinary empirical descriptive vocabulary is not a meta vocabulary because there's nothing that stands to it as it stands to logical vocabulary. Um, it doesn't depend on some other vocabulary. Whereas the thought is the reason relations, uh, well, both the lexicon and the reason relations of the logically extended meta vocabulary depend on the lexicon and the reason relations of the base vocabulary. The lexicon of the logically extended vocabulary depends on the lexicon of the base vocabulary uh, because we literally build logically complex sentences out of the, the logical atoms in the base vocabulary. And the reason relations of uh, the logical vocabulary have to depend on, because they have to in some sense reflect the reason relations in the base vocabulary. So I'm shaping up to say at the largest uh, level of um, grain, uh, logical expressivism says uh, logical vocabularies have to be elaborated from an explicative of uh, their base vocabularies. Uh, elaborated from means there needs to be a function, which if you give it as an argument, a base vocabulary, a lexicon and a set of uh, reason relations, spits out as a value, the logically extended vocabulary uh, with its lexicon and its reason relations. That's the elaborated from side. And it also, the logical vocabulary has to be explicative of the reason relations of the base vocabulary. It must let you express in sentences in its lexicon uh, what the reason relations are of the base uh, vocabulary. So the slogan is, uh, 
logical meta vocabularies are elaborated from and explicative of base vocabularies. Or for short, they're LX, the L from elaborated and the X from explicative of. So I'll just write that as LX. Um, now, a lot more needs to be said about both halves uh, of that, about the elaborated from side and about the explicative of uh, side. But filling that in will be filling in logical expressivism uh, to say in what sense it needs to be uh, explicated, elaborated from the base vocabulary and uh, in what sense it needs to be explicative of it. Uh, when we fill those notions in, we'll get a criterion of adequacy for a logical vocabulary, uh, which gives us the function, basically what the logical rules do is uh, give us the function that goes from the reason relations of the base vocabulary to the reason relations of the logically extended vocabulary. That's gonna be what a logic in the traditional sense is. And what we'll get from thinking hard about this notion of LXness, elaborated from and explicative of a base vocabulary is criteria of adequacy of what the ideal logic would be. Um, what its expressive task is that comes with uh, normative standards for assessment of better and worse, uh, uh, more and less successful ways of performing that expressive labor. So uh, why don't we take our 15 minute break now? And when we come back, I'll begin to fill in those notions of elaboration and uh, explication. I have that it's 223. Uh, so let's come back at 238. Okay, so uh, I'm talking about the two halves of um, the expressive task that we understand logic as defined by, as demarcated by. Uh, it's elaborate, it's a vocabulary that's elaborated from a base vocabulary and that is explicative of the reason relations of that base vocabulary elaborated from and explicative of the reason relations of the base vocabulary, LX, uh, we say. And parenthetically, uh, you can think of this opposition as a uh, part of an array of distinctions that uh, are something like a map botanizing the conceptual space we're working in. Uh, there's two kinds of reason relations, implication and incompatibility. Uh, the closure structure has two uh, kinds of component, the monotonicity and the transitivity uh, relations. Uh, we distinguish two flavors of normative uh, status, commitment and entitlement. Uh, these are the distinctions we're uh, elaborating in order to um, uh, fill out the space, the conceptual space that we're working in. So to begin to think about elaboration and explicitation, there's three subsidiary desiderata or criteria of adequacy for a logic that is elaborated from and explicative of uh, base vocabularies. And the first is universality of LXness. A logical vocabulary should be LX for every vocabulary. Uh, in particular, it shouldn't be restricted to being LX only for vocabularies that satisfy closure structural uh, requirements uh, of, any, of any grade, however severe. The second, conservativeness of the elaboration. The lexicon and reason relations of the base vocabulary Remember, I'm defining a vocabulary as 
a lexicon plus a set of reason relations on it, implications and incompatibilities. Uh, the lexicon and the reason relations of the base vocabulary should be contained as subsets in the lexicon and reason relations of the logically extended vocabulary. The new vocabulary is in that sense, not just elaborated from the base vocabulary, it's actually an extension of uh, the logical vocabulary. And fifth, and this is a, a subtler point than the other two, the comprehensiveness of the explication. The logical vocabulary we said has as its principal task explicating, making explicit, putting into sentential claimable form the reason relations of the base of the base vocabulary. But it should be comprehensive in that it should also have the expressive resources to make explicit its own reason relations, not just the base vocabulary. But we should be able to form, for instance, conditionals that codify the implication relations among logically complex sentences. Uh, it shouldn't just be limited to uh, articulating the reason relations uh, among the non-logical uh, base, among the logical atoms. Now, let me say just a little bit more about each of these. Um, on universality, if we're going to build an expressive tool, we should want to build one that's as expressively powerful as possible, uh, that would hold for any vocabulary. I mean, we're eventually going to get a very spare uh, way of representing, following Genson uh, and his multi sexident um, uh, sequent calculi, we'll be able to represent reason relations just by a set of ordered pairs of sets of sentences, uh, the premise set and the conclusion set of implications, but we'll use his trick of uh, encoding uh, incompatibilities into that. So vocabulary is just going to be a set of sentences and then a set of ordered pairs of sets of sentences of premise and conclusions that stand in good implication relations. Now, lots of people would say, well, not just any set of pairs of sets of sentences is a reason relation. If there isn't some kind of transitivity, some kind of monotonicity, most people wouldn't recognize that as uh, a reason relation. But I say, look, uh, there's no harm in being able to express all of those, uh, regardless of the structural uh, conditions. Isn't that what we'd want? Now, maybe we can't get that. Maybe that's too ambitious to ask for that much expressive power. Uh, maybe we can't do that. I mean, I couldn't do it. I wanted to do it. I couldn't see how to do it. But it is possible. Wolf and Dan showed how we can do that, uh, how we can get uh, a perfectly universal uh, uh, logic. And the story I'm embarked on now is to explain how that works, how that uh, universality is achieved. Second one, I said conservativeness. Uh, I mean, the short story on conservativeness of elaboration is that it extends and so includes the base lexicon and it preserves the reason relations of the base vocabulary on the base lexicon. Uh, that's a consequence of the, of the goal of explicitation that uh, you be able that you have those things. Uh, in this sense of express explicitly, if the point of introducing logical vocabulary is to express the reason relations of the base vocabulary, then introducing the new vocabulary shouldn't change the reason relations that only involve the old vocabulary. Putting the new vocabulary in shouldn't change the reason relations that relate only the old vocabulary. It can add to them, it's got to, it's got to add new reason relations involving the new vocabulary, the logically complex sentences, uh, but uh, it shouldn't change the reason relations among the logical atoms that are in the base uh, vocabulary. Uh, notice this is different from the rational sense of explicitation 
that is uh, explicitly acknowledging as a premise something that was a consequence. There I said, we don't want it to be inconsequential. We want to allow that that makes a difference to what follows, can make a difference uh, to what follows from a premise set. But in this sense of explicitation, uh, we don't want the act of expressing, uh, codifying in a sentence, the reason relations to change the reason relations that are being codified and actually way down the line, yeah, probably we're not gonna talk about this, but there are paradoxes of, of expression where logically codifying some reason relations uh, can't be done without changing them. Um, that's the genus of which semantic paradoxes are a species, according to us. But I'm actually not gonna talk about uh, that, that that's too deep in the weeds uh, for what we're doing. Here's a slightly longer story about the uh, conservativeness requirement. And I tell this at more, in more detail in the um, sort of summary uh, essay from uh, Semantic Inferentialism and Logical Expressivism that's in Articulating Reasons and uh, is expanded in chapter two of Making It Explicit. Uh, when uh, people were still figuring out how the Genson systems worked, uh, the uh, logician Arthur Pryor uh, argued that Genson had not given us a good way to think about logical connectives because uh, he could introduce a defective logical connective that he called Tonk that was uh, a runabout inference ticket, as he said. You, you start off with uh, a language that has uh, some uh, inferences in it. He's thinking of a logical language that has logical inferences in it. But as soon as you introduce Tonk, anything follows from anything else. And that's a degenerate uh, consequence relation. And all you have to do to get Tonk is to have the introduction rule that normally goes with uh, disjunction that lets you go from A to A or B. So in this case, you can go from A to A tonk B, just as you can with disjunction, but has the elimination rule that normally goes with conjunction. So you can go from A and B to B. Uh, well, if you put those two rules together, you can go from A to A tonk B and from A tonk B to B, well, then you can go from any arbitrary A to be introducing Tonk as interest, a new relationship, a new implication between arbitrary A and B that you didn't have. Prior thought that showed that Genson's way of talking about logical connectives was broken backed. But my colleague, Noel Belknap, uh, showed that it's necessary and sufficient to avoid uh, logical connectives that will Tonk up your reason relations if you just require them that the introduction and elimination rules be conservative. That is that they not license any new implications that involve only the old vocabulary. So that's the slightly fancier story about why we want conservativeness of elaboration. And now comprehensiveness of explicitation. Remember that's the requirement that the desideratum, again, maybe, maybe you can't, Get this, but wouldn't we like it that the expressive resources that we introduce to make explicit the reason relations in the old vocabulary, the base vocabulary, also suffice to make explicit in the logically extended vocabulary, the reason relations of that very logically extended vocabulary. Now here, if you're thinking about uh, Tarski's constraints on introducing truth predicates, you may say, oh, are we gonna get into some problems there. Uh, well, surprisingly, this isn't that hard to do. Uh, in uh, Frege's Begriffsschrift of 1874, the founding document of uh, modern logic, uh, he, which I take to be also the founding, uh, uh, the original expression of logical expressivism, because he conceives his product 
he conceives his project as starting with some non-logical uh, uh, implication relations and making that explicit using logic. Uh, he says uh, that although what he's doing is just for um, mathematical expressions, that it should be easy to adapt it to uh, geometrical ones or rational mechanics or eventually chemistry and uh, physics and chemistry. Um, but, but he introduces a conditional to codify implications and negation to codify incompatibilities, though that's not exactly the way he puts it. Uh, and then shows uh, at the end that that also that those uh, expressions also suffice to codify the purely logical uh, uh, reason relations on the new vocabulary. And he doesn't remark on that as a particular achievement, but it seems to me it's a remarkable thing that uh, you can get uh, a set of logical connectives that not only have the power to make explicit uh, the reason relations of the base vocabulary, but without doing anything further to them, that also can codify all of the uh, all of the reason relations, the implications and incompatibilities of the logically extended uh, language. Uh, okay, so that's what we'd like. Uh, ideally, we'd like to introduce uh, a logic as a way, uh, as uh, a set of rules that lets us elaborate a base vocabulary into a logically extended vocabulary that uh, so has the expressive power to make explicit the reason relations of the base vocabulary and of the uh, logically extended uh, vocabulary. How are we gonna do that? Uh, well, the two principles that uh, matter most uh, for this, let me go back to uh, share this now. There's where we are, are these two principles. Uh, the deduction detachment condition on conditionals, which uh, we sometimes think of as uh, the Ramsey condition on uh, conditionals because Frank Ramsey uh, was the first one who suggested it. Uh, and that is that a premise set gamma implies that A arrow B, just in case, if you added A to gamma, B would follow from the resulting premise set. Uh, and we want that to be true in both directions. Uh, that if it's the case that adding A to gamma would have B as a consequence, according to the, re to the reason relations of the vocabulary that uh, gamma and A and B are in, uh, then we're going to add a new reason relation and say that gamma implies this new sentence, the conditional sentence, A arrow B. And on the other hand, if in the reason relations of the extended, logically extended vocabulary, some premise set implies A arrow B, that ought to mean about the reason relations of the extended vocabulary that adding A to gamma will have B as a consequence. Um, that's uh, a minimal condition. It's a thing to mean by saying that the conditional, the arrow, lets us express in a sentence what's expressed uh, in a relation between sentences by the turnstile of implication. The turnstile of implication isn't in the language that gamma and A and B are in. It's, the lang it's in the, the meta language that we use to talk about reason relations. But uh, the conditional is gonna let us express that same thing. In effect, uh, if it's true that uh, adding A to gamma 
as B is a consequence, uh, implies B, then according to gamma, the conditional is true. I mean, we don't have to talk about truth here, but uh, as an expressive device, we can say it that way. Uh, that's what the conditional means. Uh, a R O B means if you've got A, B will be a consequence. And uh, we, can, we can say that by saying, well, gamma implies this conditional, just in case if you added A to gamma, B would be a consequence. And the principle that corresponds to that for uh, negation and the reason relations of incompatibility is this incoherence or incompatibility condition on negation. Remember, we can go back and forth between a, an incompatibility relation among sentences and an incoherence property of sets of sentences because of the symmetry, uh, the structural symmetry of incompatibility. But in a single succedent uh, sequent calculus, we say gamma implies not A, just in case gamma is incompatible with A. So uh, gamma implies not green in case gamma is incompatible with green. So uh, red is incompatible with green. So red implies not green. Uh, this builds in the principle that relates Aristotelian contradictories, A and not A, uh, and Aristotelian contraries, uh, A and B, where they can't both be true. That's what, what Aristotle says a contrary is. So red and green are contraries. Uh, you can't be both red and green, but you don't need to be either one. Uh, but uh, red and not red are contradictories. Uh, you can't be both, they can't both be true, but one of them has to be. Uh, but uh, if we think not in terms, Aristotle talked about whether they could both be true, whether, they, whether one of them needed to be true, uh, but we can put that in inferential terms, this relation between contraries and contradictories, mere materially incompatible uh, claims, and this new notion, new to us, of logically inconsistent claims. Uh, a and not A are logically inconsistent, um, as well as being in incompatible with one another. We can put this relation by saying that uh, if we had a language, our base language, that didn't have negations in it, we could introduce them as the minimum, minimum incompatibles. So uh, not red is what's implied by everything that's incompatible with red. So it's by all the contraries. It's implied by green and blue and yellow. Uh, all of them, because they're incompatible with red, imply not red, which means not red is the minimal contrary of red, the one that in the sense that it's implied by every contrary. And you might have in the language a sentence that played that role in the reason relations, but you might not. And we're going to introduce negation so as to ensure that we don't just have contraries, we have contradictories. So we're going to add to the language of uh, a sentence that's implied by everything that's incompatible uh, uh, with a particular sentence. So the claim is that uh, these two principles are paradigms of the way in which we could codify in the language the reason relations uh, among sentences so that uh, we could introduce the conditional according to the deduction detachment principle. Uh, if that holds, then uh, 
in a recognizable sense, the conditional says that uh, A implies B. Anything you add A to will uh, give you B. We need something that implicitly has that as its content, that's gamma implies A R B, just in case if you add A to gamma, B is a consequence. And similarly for the incoherence principle. So these are the paradigms of uh, expressivist understandings of the explicative function of conditionals and negation. And as I say, we'll see that uh, because we're not just looking at single sentences, but collections of them, uh, we need conjunction and disjunction to uh, appropriately express reason relations among sets. Uh, of sentences, but these are the key principles. Uh, now, there are lots of logics that don't satisfy these uh, principles. Uh, I mean, I mentioned Graham Priest's LP, three-valued logic, LP stands for logic of paradox. It's a paraconsistent uh, uh, logic. Uh, it doesn't allow detachment from conditionals. It doesn't satisfy the DD. Uh, principle. And we expressivists accordingly say, well, you don't really have a condition uh, in it. You have something that bears some formal relations to conditionals, but it's not performing the expressive function that's essential to conditionals. Uh, for that, we need this DD uh, condition. Uh, now, uh, these conditions are not sufficient to determine a logic because they only tell you what the role of the new logical connectives is as conclusions of implications. They don't tell you what, it, what its role is on the left of the turnstile. Uh, and it's at least not obvious that they tell us about the incompatibilities uh, of these uh, of these things, just the implications. So there's a lot more work that has to be done. I mean, it turns out uh, that saying this about the use of, about the role of the conditional say uh, on the right of the turnstile uh, really does put strong constraints on what the rule is for introducing it on the left. Uh, it, uh, it basically determines what those rules uh, have to be, and we'll see that these things actually do, these rules do actually determine the incompatibilities as well as uh, the uh, implications. Uh, so there's all that work to be done. I haven't given you a set of logical rules yet. Uh, this is just to give you the idea of how uh, the explicative of reason relations idea works that um, this is why logical meta vocabularies, um, uh, which can be, this is showing you how to elaborate uh, conditionals from logical atoms, right? If we read the DD condition from right to left, it's telling us in terms that don't involve conditionals, in terms of the reason relations of the base, it's telling us something about the reason relation of uh, the logically extended language. And similarly for the negation condition, what's on the right is something that can already be true uh, as a reason relation in the base vocabulary. And it's saying how to elaborate that into a reason relation in the new vocabulary in such a way that uh, the new vocabulary you've introduced will let you say in the new vocabulary that that implication holds or that uh, incompatibility holds. Oh, uh, so that's the philosophical uh, idea. Uh, what what we're going to look at next is sort of the details of how you make that uh, is how you make that work. But let me pause there. Oh, uh, 
this is the vision, this is the desideratum. We want universally LX uh, vocabulary elaborated from and explicative of the reason relations of any vocabulary whatsoever. And here's the, you know, the motivating idea about what being able to make explicit in a claim those reason relations is. Uh, now the challenge is to make that make that all work in an actual up and running logical system. So let me pause now to ask about this aspiration, this characterization of an expressivist task. Uh, one of my, uh, the title of one of my articles from four or five years ago is from logical expressivism to expressivist logics. Uh, and we're right in the middle of that title right now. That is, I've said what logical expressivism is and what it wants. That's the logical expressivism, expressivism we're coming from. Uh, how do you get to expressivist logics, logics that can actually do it? Um, and you know, I will be glad if my explanation of the way the logics work works for you and you can understand it. But if it doesn't work at all, uh, this is the important thing to get. This is what we want. And insofar as you don't understand what I go on to say about sort of how it works, well, you're gonna be in a position of having to take my word for it that it does. Oh, well, I'll bring in Dan and you can take his word for it uh, next time. He understands how it works and can show that it works better than I can. But uh, the technical details that are to follow are not the philosophical point. This is the philosophical point. And then uh, the technical point, and actually here's how you can roll up your sleeves and get this uh, to work. And there's a limit to how much of that you need to understand. Some of it's really cool that I'm gonna be telling you about. I think I can uh, convey it even if uh, logic is not one of your uh, languages you're comfortable in. But uh, if that fails, you will not be uh, missing what we need to go on with this project, which remember is titled Meta Vocabularies of Reason. And we're looking at the first kind now, the logical ones. We have yet the semantic ones uh, yet to come. Are there comments and questions at this point? Okay, well, I hope you can see how uh, this can seem like a worthwhile enterprise, uh, how uh, rethinking the task of logic from this point of view uh, sets a determinate technical task, which as it turns out, no extent logic satisfied, uh, but which it wasn't obvious couldn't be satisfied. And in fact, what's most remarkable uh, about the result is how small the tweaks are that you have to make to uh, uh, logics that, that already were well studied uh, in order to get something that, uh, uh, that works. We started, uh, this is, you know, the result of 10 years worth of work in the logic group. And as I say, I'm not the one who figured it out, but we started with really exotic uh, forms of logic. Let's add this bit of Baroque machinery in order to get this feature. And so, well, can we keep formal control over this Baroque bit of machinery? Well, yes, we can. We can. And then once you know, we had something that worked, we said, well, now, wait a minute, couldn't we do the same thing we're doing with this by this combination of more standard techniques? Couldn't we do this one? And gradually pared the thing down and suddenly we were looking at something, oh, this is not, this is not that weird. Um, so, okay, well, that's what we're going to go on to see. So, uh, what defining a logic is, on this definition is defining a certain kind of elaboration function, uh, a function that when you give it as an argument, uh, a base vocabulary, 
uh, will return as a value. Uh, A, log a logically extended uh, vocabulary, one that's logically extended from the base vocabulary that has to meet all kinds of constraints, including the expletive ones. But basically what a logic is, what defining a logic is, is defining that function from base vocabularies to uh, logically extended vocabularies. And we can think of that in two parts. Uh, the first part has to be a function from lexicon to lexicon from the sentences of uh, the base vocabulary to the sentences of the extended vocabulary. And that is gonna be pretty easy. Uh, but then we need a function that goes from the reason relations of the base vocabulary to the reason relations of the extended uh, vocabulary. Uh, and, and that's where all the action really is. Uh, so that's what I wanna talk about first. Now, uh, the function from lexicon to lexicon, uh, I said would be easy, but it's worth looking a little bit closely at uh, how we do it. So here again, let me follow on with you in. Okay, I'm talking about point nine here on the handout. Uh, so the base lexicon is L0. The zero is because that's how many logical connectives it has in it. It's the logically atomic lexicon, L0. Uh, L unsubscripted, that's where we're going. Um, and basically what we wanna do is uh, add conditionals and negations relating base sentences. Oh, let's throw in the Boolean helper monkeys, throw in the conjunctions and disjunctions too. Uh, and then the conjunctions and disjunctions, the negations and the conditionals of all those sentences and so on and so on. Uh, what we're going to get is, uh, sorry, suppose we've started with uh, a finite set of logically atomic sentences. That's our lexicon. So you can think of them as just uh, N proposition letters. That's what we start with. Uh, what we're going to get is an infinite lexicon. Uh, there's an infinite number of sentences. In it. Uh, but each sentence is of finite length. It's just or any finite length, there's always a longer one. Uh, any sentence in it, you can always negate it. Now you have a longer one. Uh, now you can make it the antecedent of a conditional, get a longer one. Uh, so we need to generate an infinite set of finitely long, logically complex sentences, uh, each of which will be built out of um, logically atomic base sentences by the application of these connectives. And here's a way to do that. This is a standard way. Define L as the smallest set by inclusion, such that first, the base lexicon is in it. L0 is in L. And second of all, if alpha and beta are any two elements in it, whether they're atomic or non, then their conjunction is in it, is a sentence, their disjunction is a sentence, and the conditional that has one as an antecedent and the other as a consequent is in it. And if alpha is a sentence in that set, then not alpha is. You can show that that defines a well-defined set the smallest set by inclusion, such that it contains this core L0, and uh, for any sentence in it, it contains its negation, and for any pair, it contains the conditional, the conjunction, the disjunction formed from that. 
why does that yield a well-defined um, set? Because the definition I've given there has very nice structural properties. It's a closure operation. Uh, if you started with uh, uh, L0 and just uh, uh, applied the connectives once to get a superset of it, uh, applying that operation to those two would always only increase it. That is, it's a monotonically increasing function uh, and it's transitive. If you apply this whole function to a set and then apply this function to it again, it doesn't change. Think of those two Tarski closure functions. This is a topological closure operator that we've defined by saying, if these elements are in it, then these other ones are too for any elements uh, of the set. So here in the syntax, we help ourselves to a closure operation and act because it has very nice properties. That's why the logicians liked that for implication uh, relations. Turns out they were dazzled by the mathematical beauty and tractability of it. But in this case, we, we want that. And uh, I say it's, it's important to hover a little bit uh, over this, to linger with it, uh, make sure you, you know how it works, because it's going to be exactly the same structure for the reason relations, as we'll define a closure operator as the smallest set of implications and incompatibilities that contains the base one. And if it contains these implications, then it contains these others. Uh, and the rules that do that are the sequent rules that define the connectives. They're the ones that say, if these sequence are in the set of reason relations, then these other sequence are. And we just close under those operations. That's how we're going to define one set of reason relations from another. So what I want to say next is how that works. Um, let me pause just for a second. Are there questions or comments about just the syntactic side of this? Uh, generating the lexicon of the logically extended vocabulary from the lexicon of the base vocabulary. Is that okay? Um, yeah, please, Sam. Oh, I was wondering, can, can you use the incoherence and incompatibility condition to uh, build introduction and elimination rule for negation? I saw in Dan Kampala's paper, he uses another, he uh, make the negation, the introduction and elimination rule only use the implication to not use in incompatibility. But I was right. wondering whether we can use incompatibility for the introductory rules. It turns out that, uh, so, so I uh, mentioned, I think, the, um, notational convenience that Genson introduced uh, that let him uh, absorb the incompatibility relations into the implication relation. So uh, if one introduced uh, a special symbol, perp, uh, uh, then in the single succident calculus, you can say gamma is incoherent by saying gamma implies this special symbol, perp. It implies the bad thing. Uh, that means the whole set gamma is inco incoherent. And that means if we take any element of it, say A is in gamma, uh, that gamma minus A is incompatible with A. We could use our hash mark 
there to say that. And that'll be true for any element of gamma because uh, incompatibility is symmetric. So we, we do two things. We express the incompatibilities as incoherences of sets rather than as a relation. That we can just go back and forth. And then second, we code the, the incoherences in uh, the implication relation. And now we're going to do that in a multi-succident um, uh, system, which uh, I think I mentioned that some people, uh, for instance, uh, Smiley and Rumfit, uh, contemporary logicians who are bilateralist, but of a different kind than Restall and Ripley, uh, they go bilateralist in their understanding of turnstiles because they think they only understand single, single consequences. Uh, they don't understand what it means for uh, gamma to imply the whole set delta uh, in, a, in the sense of multi succident uh, uh, sequent calculi. And so they want, and because Genson had this fabulous result that using his, his uh, rules, if you had a single succident uh, turnstile, only allows one consequence, you get intuitionist logic. But if you allow multiple conclusions, you get classical logic. Mm. Smiley and Rumfit only understand, profess only to understand, philosophically only understand uh, the single succident turnstile, but they want classical logic and they showed you could get that by going bilateral. Um, but we know from Restall and Ripley how to understand the multi succident uh, sequent. Uh, and that's. Uh, uh, here in 10, um, we say that gamma implies delta. Those are sets. What that means is that commitment to accept everything in gamma precludes entitlement to reject everything in delta. That is, you've got to accept something that's in delta. That's why the comma, if we wrote out the elements of delta on the right, is disjunctive. Uh, so we understand that. Uh, and so we can use the multi succident uh, calculus. This is an important step in sort of making all this work is to do it in the multi succident uh, uh, pattern. And then uh, Genson's clever trick was to say, well, the way I'm going to code what I'm calling the incoherence of gamma, uh, which is itself a way of representing the incompatibilities, is just to have my turnstile with an empty right side. If there's nothing on the conclusion side, that means gamma is incoherent. And that means that it's incompatible with, th that every subset of it is incompatible with every other uh, with every element of it, sorry. So uh, if gamma comma A turnstile empty set, uh, if that's a good implication, that's a way of saying gamma, gamma is incompatible with A. That's just a, a convenient convention. But using that convention means we can represent all the reason relations of any vocabulary just as the set of pairs gamma delta, such that gamma implies delta. It's just we code the incompatibilities by gamma comma empty set. I mean, I will, I think I mentioned last time that he uses the empty set on the left, on the premise side, to, to express theoremhood. If uh, a follows from no premises, he says, well, then it's a theorem. Um, but we don't actually care about that. 
uh, because that notion of a theorem isn't interesting if you're going to worry about non-monotonic consequence relations uh, in a monotonic setting. If A follows from nothing, then it follows no matter what you put on the left. But in a non-monotonic setting, the fact that it follows from nothing doesn't tell you anything about whether it follows from substantive things on the other side. So from a formal point of view, the advantage of this trick, which I warned about being misled, you know, people have been misled, misled by how technically convenient this trick of codifying uh, incompatibilities and incoherences into the implication relation have been misled into demoting incompatibility to second class status as a reason relation, not appreciating that it's of the same status 